Hello? Hello. I'm going to assume that this is working. Um, I'm going to assume that this is working. Uh, let me just double check. Hello? Hello. Okay, it is working. That sounds great. Um, hi, my name is Hannah Tyndall. Um, I'm a debater at the LSE and I am doing a presentation on development um, in that general content area, which should be very interesting. Um, if you do have any questions for me, feel free to send them in. Um, I won't necessarily promise to answer them all here, but I could send you a message or answer them in detail or send you something to read if you really want to. Um, so feel free to try and make this as interactive as possible. My aim here with this session is to try and make it more analytically focused than strategically focused. So I'm going to focus much more on sorts of arguments you can make about different versions of development policy than I am on maybe like the strategy of development debate. And that's for a couple of reasons. The first is that I think a lot of the reasons that development debates are often quite bad, especially quite strategically poor, is because people have fundamentally analytically weak. So I think that sometimes people will say things like, slavery was terrible and therefore the Western world owes reparations to these nations and so they should do that in the form of aid. And people don't respond to that, that's something that's taken as given and people don't have the analytical ability to respond to things which become accepted truths in debating like aid does good for the poor in the world and the Western world owes people aid or, or even FDI is good or the global free trade order is rigged. I think there are some basic facts that we assume. And so I think my primary aim with this session is to try and quash some of those facts, have a little bit more of explaining the side I think that you don't normally hear. And that should hopefully mean that people are better able to challenge perceived wisdom in debating and probably then mean that people can make more strategically interesting decisions given they're better able to challenge those facts. I also think that I'm better at analysis than I am at strategy, so you probably have more to learn from that. Um, the way that this presentation is going to work is it's going to follow a historical narrative. So I'm basically going to say there were four periods or waves of development policy. So there were four broadly different approaches of how the Western world, but also those countries themselves, tried to encourage development, whether that be economic growth or development more in social and political senses. Um, I'm going to basically use that historical narrative to look at four different ways in which we can perceive development to try and look at the advantages and disadvantages of all of them. I think almost all development policy falls into one of these four things um, and so that should be quite useful. Things which I probably should be talking about but because I decided to stretch this I'm not are both I won't really mention anything about colonialism and I also won't really talk Talk about the resource curse. Both of those are probably quite important things for you to have a very basic understanding. Um, if people send me questions, I'm happy to say a couple of things, but just to let you know they won't be covered. So, what are we going to do? So, I think the first thing, and if you've listened to the other um, YouTube video, which is up where I talk about economics, um, I say that fundamentally, if you want to study, understand development economics, you need to talk about poverty traps. Um, believe it or not, I'm saying the exact same thing here. If you want to understand and make arguments about development economics, you need to talk about poverty traps. So, I think the first thing to do is try and explain what those are and try and explain what those, why those are so important. Because, especially from an economics perspective, they're just the bedrock of why countries in the world are still poor and why that's such a bad thing. Then um, we'll get into the meat of it. So what is a poverty trap? So a poverty trap is an idea in economics where you are unable to achieve future good outcomes because of your current condition. So economics is full of time lags. The vast majority of things have time lags and time lags are probably inherent in investment. So if I'm a farmer and I buy some seeds, I will be at time lag before I'm able to gain the revenue from those seeds because seeds need to grow. If I'm a student um, and I want to get a better job, there is a time lag because there is a long period of time where I need to go to school. Often that means that you need the investment money and the investment capital before you can reap income rewards and get any revenue from that capital. That's especially a problem in poor countries, especially like think of your traditional subsistence or incredibly poor agricultural workers because they just don't have enough capital, enough income to begin with in order to have an investment 
in order to reap the higher income return. So if you think of one one man entrepreneur businesses who are unable to buy capital, whether that be wheelbarrows, whether that be even like stock or some form of machinery in order to produce a better product or making more income. Um, You see that when people are sick, um, they would earn more money if they were healthy, but they're unable to afford the medicine in the here and now. You see that with education, they would be better uh, educated and therefore probably richer if they went to school, but they cannot afford the school fees in the here and now. So that's the basic understanding of poverty traps. And poverty traps can also probably occur at like the nationwide level as well. Some people say so. So um, institutions are self-reinforcing. So you need to have a certain level of um, wealth in society, a certain level of education in order to have good governance and good accountability mechanisms that will make you richer. But because you because you're, there's a time lag, um, you're unable to have those good like democratic institutions without being wealthy. And it's hard to be wealthy without having those good democratic institutions. So the whole of development is decided that there's a time lag and people struggle to break out of that system. And development economics is broadly about how to do that. I'm going to be talking about, as I said, four different historical time periods and four different ways that they tried to do that. Broadly, that's industrialization. Um, so very state-led um, economic nationalism, that's um, like the Washington consensus. So uh, growth will get you out of poverty traps. The next one is what I'm calling human capital, but it's aid. Um, these people are poor and can't afford education, so often schooling. Um, so basically just giving people money. Um, and then the third is my more individualized based ones. So bypassing the state altogether. And those are things like microfinance. So where you just try and do direct interventions within those communities in order to bypass the poverty traps. All four of these are to some extent economically sound ways about why you might help get people out of poverty and um, we're going to be talking about them in a little more detail. Okie okay, So the first thing is this is very historical, um, trying to build a historical narrative for a couple of reasons. Firstly because I think if you put it in the context of history it's then easy to relate it to other experiences or other information you have about that time period so hopefully that will help you remember it better but also see some of the more social ramifications of that. So the first period we're going to look at is the period just after the Second World War, probably till about the 70s, maybe early 80s. And this is a period of broadly economic nationalism. So this is a period where the Soviet Union and its planned economy is doing very well. Um, lots of countries are, want to fend off the idea of socialism to so try and get increasingly accepted to have planned um, and state economies in countries which are nominally capitalist it's an area of quite a lot of price and quantity controls it's worth saying that keynesian economics um especially post the great depression is in its ascendancy um so people think that there is a large role for the state and a large role for state investment and broadly the academic consensus around the time is if you want to be rich you have to behave like a rich country so you have to produce like the rich uh, rich countries produce cars so lots of people set up their own state businesses to try and produce quite high-end goods. Cars is a very classic example, um, but broadly there was a shift away from our cultural things and also countries set up factories to produce things like shoes um, or to produce uh, text, textiles was quite common. So this is also a system of dependence theory. So it fundamentally screws over our poorer countries um, through incredibly unfair trade and so they should try and um, not play to those trade rules but restrict, um, but break them. So there was a lot of what we call um, import substitution industrialization, where countries would have incredibly high tariffs and try and restrict the amount of um, imports of goods that could come in in order to build up home industries and try and trade. So it was an era of quite economic nationalism, countries wanted to be self-sustainable, uh, self everyone wanted to import, um, not many people wanted to export, which as those of you who see the world as a whole thing obviously can't happen, you can't have every country be a net importer because someone has to buy the goods. Anyway. This is the context. Uh, this is a post Second World War. Um, I want to talk a little bit about whether this was a good policy or whether it was a bad policy. So there were some reasons this was good. Um, it probably is true that the world order, especially then, but also incredibly true now, is rigged against far smaller countries. Um, there were very high tariffs, especially with Western countries, um, 
Western countries not allowing imports. So the um, subsidization of industries was something that's probably necessary if you wanted to do a large amount of trade. And it's also worth saying that even now there's an incredibly unfair system um, of trade. So although we have lowered tariffs, especially since the introduction of both GATT and the WTO, and tariffs are now about an average of about 10% across the world, where they used to be nearer 70 or 80 there are still lots of reasons that poor countries struggle to build up industries because of these regulations so the eu has an incredibly high tariff on solar panels which means that they can't be produced in countries like china but also poorer countries in the far east and the reason for that is because they want to cultivate the German solar panel industry that's something that um, restricts the ability for industrialization in poorer countries um, but there are other so there are other examples um, for example the Americans still have a very high tariff on chickens um, Haiti which is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere has a very successful uh, local chicken uh, business lots of people use that as their prim primary agriculture source but they're simply unable to export them to the US because there are these very high tariffs um, the EU less now but still to some extent engages in dumping where it produces excess of certain goods and will just dump them so give them to um, uh, other markets and mess with the price of those goods and again destroy local industries so to some extent the rationale behind this economic nationalism and this attempt to try and industrialize and build up these industries was based on this idea that the world order was unfair and that is true there are lots of there are other examples of where it is probably necessary to engage in this sort of trade policy to become rich because it's simply you're not on a level playing field um, and so given that you would naturally be able to have that comparative advantage so produce that good relatively cheaper than anywhere else you're unable to do so there are other advantages of this economic protectionism with the high tariffs and the isi policy another one was it is able to gain revenue so i think when we live in incredibly rich westernized countries we think that it's actually governments are able to you know tax income and tax goods and that's all fine but it's actually very hard to gain tax revenue in these countries um firstly there's a large amount of corruption often you have to tax quite um things like property often um there's a huge amount of corruption that happens there because you're, um, it's very easy to bribe and there aren't very good records on income or goods prices. So it's not obvious who you tax and it's very hard to collect good information. So tariffs were a very good and easy way for governments to gain revenue. Um, if they had a tariff at the border, that meant that any goods that were imported, they have to pay a certain price. That was money that the government could be relatively sure on without actually much need of a very good um, state structure and not that much state capacity needed. The last argument here is this idea of an infant industry argument. So this is probably what you hear most common in reference to the countries like Korea, which did use this policy and actually managed to develop from it, unlike other examples we'll talk about where they didn't um, and what we'd say here is this idea that countries become uh, industries become more productive as they get bigger so as an industry is bigger it's able to specifically train a workforce in a certain way it's able to get economies of scale it's able to get um, manufacturers and other subsidiary businesses around that industry set up and it means that it can produce far more and export far more if it's bigger. So that means that countries ha who have a very like small, um, let's say, electronics industry would subsidize that industry for a period of 10, 20 years, able to be able to get that industry to be uh, economically prosperous and able to become more competitive because it benefits from scale and it benefits from being larger, undo those tariffs and it will be able to trade on the world market at a competitive rate. So that's this idea that um, companies when they're infant are uncompetitive but if you protect them and they get bigger then they will become competitive and that was shown to be relatively successful um, in Korea lots of people credit their use of tariffs and their use of protectionism as one of the reasons they got rich so there are reasons to believe that this version of economic nationalism is very good at overcoming the resource curse why is that because it enables people to get higher paying jobs um so the problem of the resource curse now would probably be that 
Um, these companies don't inve invest because it's so small. So if the government coordinates that investment and coordinates the sort of industries and picks the sort of industries that country could have, that means that it can gain the benefits of having those industries, which is something that the market on its own would not, or the world trade order because it's so ripped, would not be able to get. So the idea is that you're, um, you allow countries to industrialize become richer and you need government intervention in order to come the fact, overcome the fact the market would not get there on its own. Sounds lovely. Uh, unfortunately, um, it was relatively unsuccessful. So I would say that the vast majority of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, vast majority of countries in Latin America, countries like India and um, Pakistan all engaged with this um, with relatively little success. There are like the history is littered with examples of incredibly unsuccessful car brands which were the nation's car brands incredibly heavily subsidized and ultimately just unable to compete with more superior european or american brands um but there are a couple of reasons that this policy what did end up being so unsuccessful the first was that governments were not very good at picking industries. Um, governments would often pick industries because they have had some form of national prestige, which is one of the reasons cars were picked so much. But also, they were incredibly dominated by special interests. So a lot of the, um, a lot of Latin America, um, they had lobbying groups, um, and that meant that often they didn't pick industries that their country would be particularly good at or that they had enough of a skilled workforce to support um, but because there were individuals who owned those industries and wanted government protection um, they also weren't very responsive to market forces if you have an industry that's an entirely protected um, and that means that your home market is predominantly buying your national brand of car you don't really face any competitive forces you face no reason to get it better and no reason to like use the new technology that um is, is happening in other countries so they weren't very innovative they weren't very competitive and they were often just unsuited for that economic environment and that can be shown um isi so import substitution industrialization just ended up bankrupting a large number of countries so um the structural adjustment plans which came in and around the late 70s early 80s were firstly due to the uh, unfortunate economic events so the world oil price rose massively and it was true that given most of these countries were subsidizing oil that harmed their deficits but also import substitution industrialization was exceptionally expensive because you had to pay these firms to subsidize them massively and often what that meant was that these countries simply couldn't afford that economically because they were just subsidizing incredibly inefficient businesses so often these these policies didn't produce particularly good home industries um and home industries that didn't become particularly economically successful and so they're broadly considered to be a failure that might be because of the political systems at the time it's true that most of these countries didn't have governments that were particularly accountable so may have been more susceptible to corruption and special interests than perhaps today so it might be um these policies might not have been particularly successful because of the circumstances of the time but it is true that by the late 1970s these were countries with large amounts of debt they were unable to pay back and that's one of the reasons that the IMF and the World Bank did stay in. Another thing I would say is that industrial policy and industrial strategy is having some form of resurgence um, especially among um, people in development who think that it is fundamentally true that the only way you become rich is through industrialization and that central observation that if you want to be a rich country you have to produce what a rich country does if you want to be a rich country you have to do high productivity um, industries it might be true so there has been there is a debate and there are also debates set around this debate about the extent to which you can become rich through agriculture. And I would say that there's varying evidence. So it is true that agricultural yields in countries like China have risen about four or five fold fold so productivity there has increased dramatically and that has to some extent helped with the fact that its rural communities did become richer the green revolution in india is another example of where agricultural productivity increases can lead to an inc increase in wealth 
but agricultural pro productivity has been broadly stagnant in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and also, even though India did have the green technology and was able to gain some productivity growth and therefore income growth from that agriculture, it's probably never going to get um, rich or even middle income through the use of agriculture. So there has been a resurgence in this idea of economic nationalism because people believe that industrialization might only be the only route to prosperity and that there are the obstacles that were identified after the Second World War broadly true today, that you do need your industry to be relatively big before it's able to be globally competitive and there is unfair trade policy. So industrial strategy has some proponents today, or we might see it come back um, and we'll see if it's more successful this time. So that is the first wave. It lasted broadly about 40 years. Um, it was very interesting. Um, let's now talk about the second. Um, the way in which, the re one of the reasons I've structured this historically is because I think it's worth saying that the waves were all responses to one another. So the response to the wave of economic nationalism was the Washington Consensus and was structural adjustment programs. Why was that? because broadly they thought the state was overly bloated. They thought the price and quantity controls and trade policies were hugely costly for states which had incredibly bloated industries that were crowding out other private industries. So the fact that there was an incredibly well subsidised car industry, for example, meant that entrepreneurs or other business people or even foreign direct investment that wanted to try and set up a separate industry which may have been more internationally competitive was being crowded out because the subsidized industry was still able to find the best workers and have the best government connections etc etc so they saw the state was overly bloated it is also true that this is the era of the 80s there was a great reform in the way we thought about economics the oil price spike had entirely discredited Keynesian economics and there was increasing consensus that like, economic orthodoxy, free markets, lack of state involvement, lack of state intervention, um, this Washington consensus, this idea of liberalisation was exceptionally important. And I would say another academic thought on top of this was this idea of dual liberalisation. So people thought that the more economically liberal your country was, the more politically liberal it would be as well. And they thought that if you allowed people economic freedom, that would bring about more democracy and more political freedom on top of that. So there was a huge academic consensus around this idea of the Washington Consensus and around this idea of more economic liberalisation, which brings us into wave two of development theory. Now, this one I'm going to call growth. So their idea of how you break out the property trap was you create the environments for growth and that will succeed. Some of these people, the Milton Friedman is an example of this, deny that property traps even exist in themselves. They say they don't exist and you just need to create the environment for economic growth and that will cure all. So their idea is that you'd have a, a level of economic orthodoxy, you create idealised market conditions, you'd have a very small state, and you should see these countries grow a lot. <sighs> Spoiler, they didn't at all. And we'll have a little bit of chat. Um, chat about that. So one of the ideas behind these, the main way that this policy was seen the main, like, when what this policy mainly looked like were structural adjustment programs. So when these countries faced incredibly large debts and deficits and did basically default, they were then um, uh, intervened by the IMF being the lender of last resort, and they were given programs, which meant that they had to follow them um, and cut their state hugely, um, try and uh, lower uh, end their budget deficit, lower their debt, it by large amounts and follow very prescriptive economic labour reforms um, and often austerity programmes in order to continually get this money. Um, this is not dissimilar to the sort of conditions that the Troika imposed on Greece um, and it comes from a very similar philosophy. The idea that the reason your country got into such a large amount of debt was because you were doing economically bad things and we will use economic orthodoxy and austerity in order to return your country to a path of fiscal sustainability. Um, there are economic reasons behind this. So one of their main ideas was that if you had a more economically orthodox country, you'd be able to get more 
foreign direct investment. So in example, in countries like Latin America, they were very insistent on setting up stock markets and setting up the sorts of institutions of financial capital that should be able to get more FDI into that country. Um, FDI is obviously a way you can overcome the poverty trap because let's say that you are a farmer and you can't afford to buy the seeds. Um, plant the seeds to, in order to gain it um, in order to reap the revenue even though the revenue from that seed will be substantially larger than the cost of the seeds itself so you have to um, use someone else's land um, in a system of sharecropping which makes everyone poorer the idea is that if there were other people willing to invest other people willing to buy those seeds for you perhaps they would get a share of the profit but you as a country would be richer so this idea of having more international capital should be able to facilitate growth and there will be more entrepreneurship because they would face less barriers the, the large state and high taxes is bad for business um there's not much evidence of it causing growth um obviously it's very hard to separate specific economic policy from general trends but the 80s was a time of relatively low growth and there are also economic reasons why this failed i mean our arguments against austerity which are used today which were also used then arguments about how the lots of people had state jobs there wasn't much money in the economy and that meant that if you took that money out people would be able to buy a few buy fewer things and that would become a somewhat reinforcing cycle there was often um lots of anger amongst uh, also a lot of lower living conditions and lower standards the fact that public sector wages saw a massive cut massively increased corruption the fact that we stopped subsidizing things like fuel and bread led to riots and quite a lot of anger and poverty because these were necessities that people received in their life um, which were no longer being subsidized by the government. Um, there was also a lot of problems um, with services. So education and healthcare budgets both got caught, cut quite dramatically. And some people say that maybe facilitated the increase of HIV AIDS and the reason it was able to spread so fast because in Southern Africa, the quality of those healthcare systems had just been cut and that meant that they were unable to deal with such a large outbreak. There was also where it was successful at causing growth, caused incredibly unequal growth because some people were able to access that international capital and got a lot richer, but there were no fundamental redistribution um, relationships within the economy. Um, there was a lot of privatization of a lot of these state-run businesses. Um, the IMF was very incredibly willing to privatize things. Uh, a good example of this is in Russia. Russia had a IMF-led program when it came out of the Soviet Union in the late 90s, so slightly later. Um, and the IMF thought that if it created a class of business owners um, and a class of the uh, prosperous middle class, they would forever preserve, um, they would preserve and protect property rights and ensure that communism never came back. So this oligopolistic class and this incredibly unequal society was something that the IMF was purposely made because it thought that they would be the protector of economic systems and economic institutions. Obviously, firstly, um, the, they didn't. They became incredibly cronyist and uh, instead probably distorted some political systems. But also the IMF was quite willing to have quite an unequal system, especially with things like these privatisations. So a lot of what they did in these structural adjustment programmes can be criticised. Is there a bright spot? I mean, they hmm. yes and no. It is also probably true that to some extent they were true about how you get economic growth. A lot of their policies would produce economic growth. And I think the fundamental criticism of the Washington Consensus this is that maybe growth isn't development. Maybe the IMF believing these countries just needed to grow out of poverty is not the same place where they're healthy and where they're educated um, and where they live in good societies. Maybe the Growth. It didn't make up the fact that the states had fundamentally changed and had a different set of obligations to their citizen. So I think that the main criticism of this orthodox approach is probably not that it could eventually create growth, um, although there is questions over that too, but that its vision for society is probably not what development really is. Growth and GDP growth is probably not is probably deeper than that and probably there are other things that matter 
two. Now this criticism of the Washington Consensus, as you can see, led us into the good growth agenda, this idea of having more sustainable goals. So you have the Millennium Development Goals, you had um, Jeffrey Sachs say, you have people saying make poverty history, you have the campaigns with the little white bands and a massive flood of aid, the idea that actually we wanted development, we wanted better living standards, we wanted education, and there was a massive push. Um, this um, push after the Washington Consensus. Again, in the same way that you can see the Washington Consensus is a direct response to the economic nationalism before, this aid and this growth of aid about um, starting in around the millennium, starting in around 2000, is again a direct response to um, the uh, to the Washington Consensus. It's the idea that we need to rebuild these countries' social infrastructure. So. This era is the idea that the way, third wave, is the idea that the way you overcome the poverty trap and the way you um, allow countries to be rich is that you invest in human capital. So you make sure that people are educated, you make sure that people are healthy, you make sure that people have access to clean water and sanitation, and then you make sure that they're in, they are the best selves and therefore they are able to earn enough income so you provide healthcare so people don't um, aren't poor because of health problems, because they have better access to healthcare. Everyone gets an education, which means that broadly the extra average another year of school increases your income by about 10%. So people can be richer because they're necessarily educated because there's been a huge investment in school. So that's this idea. You use human capital in order to overcome the poverty trap. Um, there was also an idea that you needed to increase government capacity. Um, the Washington Consensus had slashed um, that ability, and so there were um, deliberate attempts to try and hire more people and uh, create a better um, system there. Um, this aid is often in the form of loans. Um, with a very low um, rate of interest. Um, it will also be said that there are these loans uh, often by the World Bank, um, it's called ODA. Um, the interest uh, is r often written off um, and there was a big, um, in the late early 2000s, there was a big attempt to write down all the debt that these countries had, um, but they are expected to pay them back. Um, but this, these loans are sometimes conditional and sometimes are not. Um, we'll talk a little bit about conditionality later. Um, and so this, there was a large increase in the amount of aid that countries got. Um, there are a lot of reasons everyone likes aid. Um, I don't think I've ever in a debate heard an argument against aid, um, especially not aid in a country that's normally a democracy. Um, it did lead to increases in government capacity. Um, far more people around go to school, although their standards um, and the levels of literacy have not increased nearly as fast. Um, people are predominantly healthier. Um, we There have been probably the biggest improvement that AIDS has given is very clear, um, noticeable increases in health. Um, and life expectancy has increased a lot, although it's still um, far from a standard we'd expect in the Western country. So there are lots of reasons to like age. Uh, so I won't talk about them more, because what I think would be more interesting is I would say that most economists, although by all means that's not a consensus, um, would dislike age. There are definitely a lot of Nobel Prize winners who think that it's probably a waste of time, uh, not necessarily a waste of time, but done exceptionally badly and might not be worth it. I think that the economic consensus about aid is often very different to the more uh, generalised consensus you see on the news and definitely also different um, to the consensus you get in your average debate. So here are a list of reasons um, why we might think aid is bad. Um, the first is this idea of conditionality. Um, Conditionality, when it came with the Washington Consensus, was almost universally decried. So these countries had very little choice in cutting their deficit, um, cutting their services, reshaping their labour laws, reshaping the way they, um, reshaping the sort of relationship they have with their citizens. Um, they were in large amounts of debt, they needed more money, they needed the IMF to give them that money, and those were conditional. There's also a lot of conditionality with aid. Um, we force countries to change pieces of legislation, we force them to hold elections, um, and 
it seems that while one is decried as being neo-colonial, the other is not. Um, and I think that the only reason for that distinction is that people just like the conditions more, which is fair. But I do think that given the level of conditionality there is, there probably is some question of sovereignty when it comes into this. So for example, Actually, no. There's a second question, which is that we're not very good at making things conditional. We're very bad at measuring the performance of aid. And there's very little effort that goes into assessing what works and doing follow up studies. There's also not, we're also quite bad at making things conditional on laws. So often the countries will pass the law but not necessarily enforce it. It's very easy to make things conditional on doing one thing but it's very hard to make something conditional on the average like an average indicator being x for the next five years so for example that we made malawi's aid which is about 20 percent of its state budget conditional on it passing a access to information bill so the equivalent of a freedom of information bill in the uk they did and they got their 20 percent of aid but no one has been able to use that bill um and that's not necessarily something which while on the books uh, factors into people's lives there are other examples so in the 1990s make kenya which is another very aid dependent country aid conditional on um holding another election uh, moi who was in power in Kenya at the time, decided to hold another election. But there was nothing in that that said that that election had to be free and fair. And actually it was anything but. So we're quite bad at making things conditional because often we can only ask for one change, be it a legal change or a bill, and have really enforced on how it's enacted. So you hear a lot of debates where we say, why don't we make aid conditional on being a democracy or why don't we make aid conditional on gay rights the problem with that is that it's very hard to make aid conditional on like, quite an amorphous thing like gay rights it's easy to make it conditional on passing a piece of legislation but South Africa has one of those liberal constitutions in the world especially when it comes to gay rights and actually it's pretty terrible there um like it's pretty terrible there if you are queer so it's unclear that that conditionality necessarily works sorry it's just my little rant um and i do think that his arguments are perhaps not made in the debate because they would be meaningless but i do think um we think that more important when it comes to we think that conditionality is a silver bullet when actually it's quite hard to find in particularly well. I suppose it does work, work quite well with corruption. Um, Mali spent a lot of its state budget buying very expensive um, airplanes for the people in charge and we said we won't give you more money unless you get rid of the airplanes. That worked quite successfully. So there are some examples um, but it's not necessarily the silver bullet um, that everyone hopes it is. First thing about aid. The second thing about aid and going back to that is it has fundamental problems when it comes to accountability for that country and this is linked to the idea that these countries should be sovereign but the first here is that international donors have very different desires and expectations and uh, preferences than the people on the ground um, the sorts of things they want to see in their country are not necessarily the best and not necessarily what the people want but then secondly moving on to that it's very hard for, a, for any democracy to function and for you to have any ability to sanction your leader when they're just doing what the international community wants. Um, it's very hard to sanction them if you don't um, control the amount of money that they have. Um, and it's very hard to sanction them if, for example, um, you have no accountability relationship because they don't depend on you for the amount of money you have. Um, there's no incentive for these leaders to invest in the economies of these countries because that's not what their vast majority of their, their revenue base is dependent on aid rather than that taxation. It makes you think that taxation gives people very good incentives to invest in making sure their economy is prosperous. That incentive breaks down when it's to do with aid. Lots of people think aid um, is has rentier properties in the same way as the resource curse. So the resource curse is especially bad for countries because they have a pretty much guaranteed source of money through maybe like 
oil, nat oil revenue, um, and they can use it very easily for things like corruption. And it's quite hard for the citizens of that country to hold them accountable. Aid has quite similar properties. It's um, almost guaranteed source of revenue. Um, and it is used for corruption and it is used in ways in which the citizens find quite hard to observe and quite hard to hold accountable. It has other problems of the resource curse. Um, Dutch disease is something only economists talk about. But the idea is that it incredibly overvalues your currency. So if, for example, you are given lots of aid, that means that the price of your currency appreciates hugely. That's quite bad if you're trying to manufacture something quite cheap. And one of the few advantages you have is that you can um, sell it on quite cheaply in foreign markets if your country, has if your currency even, has become a lot more expensive. That's another disadvantage of aid and in that way also cries out crowds out the private sector in the same way we were talking earlier about how subsidies do if for example you can pay um public sector employees a far higher salary than they will have in the private sector that means that you're less likely to have private businesses and the first two waves of economic growth were probably right when they said that private business is the way out of poverty because it has growth, um, it allows for productivity increases and fundamentally that's how you get rich in the long run. There's a question about whether it increases state capacity at all given a lot of this aid is um, directed through NGOs um, and a lot of um, it doesn't engage in trying to employ more state officials, but rather subcontracting that business to NGOs. So maybe it doesn't even increase the ability of the state to do things because it just uses NGOs to do them instead. Lastly, I think that it depends probably on the institutions. There is some evidence um, that good governance um, is important about whether you give people aid. So if you have good governance, if it's reliable that that country will spend its aid money on teaching and school and health, then you can ensure that that um, it's probably good aid money because it's spent on the right things and for the right reasons. But there are other examples of where it's far more likely to be corrupt. Um, good governance is also to do things like with about state capacity and the ability of those countries to do good things with their money. So I think ultimately not all aid is good. It's only works in the sense that it improves development indicators in some circumstances. Most people think that if you give aid money to economies with very extractive institutions with incredibly um, uh, patronage based leadership uh, networks with a lot of corruption it entrenches the power of autocrats and quite anti-democratic forces and probably makes that accountability and that ability for the government to work for its people worse in the long run in the exact same way that the resource curse would so in the same way when people talk about the resource curse they say well it's fine if you find oil when you're a democracy because you have the institutions set up to deal with it the same might be true of aid it's very good to give aid to a democracy because they spend it in the right ways but to be sure that they'll spend it in the right ways you probably have to have those systems there already because just giving a large amount of money to the states of countries with bad institutions is not a long-term sustainable way to make them richer it just entrenches those bad institutions and those institutions go on to affect um, the growth of that country because they affect private business and they affect FDI and they affect other people's ability and desire to set up businesses in those countries and we've seen especially as a response to a lot of the aid more emphasis on this idea of institutions so one of the most recently successful books is by Asimov and Robinson and they talk about why nations fail and the difference between um extractive institutions um and intensive uh yeah and why that's so important for a country in order to work in such a way that they have institutions which foster growth where people don't commandeer resources and um 
engage in a system of patronage and give um, loyalty to their friends and you have to be close to the government in order to achieve economically prosperous things and it's unclear to me that all of the aid that we give goes to countries which aren't like that and therefore I think that a lot of the enthusiasm about aid is misplaced um, and not it's definitely not a silver bullet um, and we're definitely not going to solve poverty by just giving quite bad and corrupt governments more money sadly um, and I think people should make those sorts of arguments more um, because I'm not sure so often I'll talk about some philosophy often the reason that we talk about giving aid is this idea that we owe a duty aid basically takes the form of reparations and we should give these countries aid because we have specifically taken from them we owe that money back it's unclear to me why that moral argument is reduced is distinct from effectiveness and whether this works um i don't think any of the moral arguments about reciprocity or reparations um are not contingent on whether aid works and given there are lots of reasons that aid probably wouldn't work in these countries i'm not sure that that is necessarily a reason that we should give aid um and i think that that's the sort again the sort of argument that i would like to see made more um moving on to my fourth wave as i say all of these waves are in many ways a response to the previous one so a lot of governments misspent aid um were not seen to be particularly effective and so the response is a more individualized focus giving of development so rather than give money to states to try and make people's lives better we now want to give money to individuals to show individuals can make their lives better so this is a wave of development that we've really seen in the last five years i would would say that it's most notable um most notable policy is microfinance and the huge rise in microfinance and allowing people access to credit um, but that is quite typical of what are quite individualized interventions so there's also um of quite a well publicized um study about ubi um whether the way to make people richer is just to give them money individually um rather than give it to their governments um, but it's often about individualized interventions specifically targeting people i'd say that a corollary of this approach to development is this use of randomized controlled trials so this use of trials which specifically work out what individually works um these trials are almost always um very uh focused on individual communities um they're small interventions that perhaps schools um and very local communities could make um they're not really focused on large-scale policies or what um, like governments could do so for example they find that deep farming is one of the most um, cost effective interventions for keeping people at school they find specific things about whether malaria nets are useful they talk about how you go about hiv testing they talk about how you go about distributing condoms in these countries so that often um feed into this behavioral economics is very individualized thing about specific interventions which change the actions of individuals so it's much more targeted development so it's far less at the state level far more at the individual level um and that's what we're seeing now and this is as i say a response to aid a response to the fact that these governments are often not very good um so you use ngos and you target people more specifically um let's talk about microfinance first microfinance is very interesting um and i'd say especially when it's so current a lot of the development debates do happen happen around microfinance why would we have microfinance well credit is the most classic example of a poverty trap right if i'm a farmer and i can't afford to buy seeds but i would have a bountiful harvest then the first thing I should do is borrow money to gain those seeds. Um, and there's often, credit is often incredibly common in like rural agricultural villages. Um, it's one of the, oh, these societies have always had money lenders and credit and they're often uh, credits considered to be usury, uh, usury and exploitative, but actually these are very important things for the functioning of a poverty trap. Um, 
that allows more enterprises, it allows more businesses to sprung up um, and allows more growth in that way that people have a business and they produce something that is profitable and they produce something that's productive. People buy it and the whole society gets richer. The second thing people say about microfinance is that it's empowering to women, which is true because it is primarily given to women. And we presume that giving women more money, even if it's in the form of credit, is empowering for them. I would, however, not make an argument about how microfinance is specifically empowering to women for a couple of reasons. The first is that all economic growth should be empowering. It seems to me that there is no distinct reason why this form of economic um, this form of economic independence is any more empowering than other forms of economic growth, where you presumably see households have an additionally large amount of money. There's also no reason to think that the women necessarily control the money in these households. These are still countries which have very patriarchal institutions. When you survey the people who've been given micro finance or microcredit about who controls the money in that household it is predominant like that 50 percent of them say that the men have probably primary control um they did a randomized control trial in indonesia where they were trying to increase the amount of savings that people made um and gave them a lockbox and a key and they found that while just to the women and they found that while savings went up also the rates of domestic violence went up too because if you give women specific control of something in a patriarchal society you haven't changed the institutional nature of the way that society operates um which is an institutional um which is a very institutional critique of a lot of this if we go back to talking about aid um if you give um people more money well let's not talk about it let's talk about uh, universal benefit, um, universal basic income. So they're giving universal basic income to um, villages all around Africa, but primarily in Kenya. Um, you might have given these people more money, but you've not changed the fundamental institutions. You've not changed the fact that property rights aren't particularly secure. You've not changed the fact that the um, government are able to steal that money if you give people money and they're still oppressed by that government or they still have very bad institutions there's no reason to think that they necessarily keep that money so i think that when we say aha we can empower people by just giving the poorest in our society money without changing the fundamental institutional structure that governs them that is quite naive and probably not the source of empowerment we think it is um, it's just a bugbear of mine, but I think that's an argument that people are quite lazy to make um, and should probably think through more. Um, they do interesting studies where they write the contracts of microfinance terms, which are quite stringent. So you have to start paying back in week one. Um, you have very high rates of interest. They go to the people who are poorest in society. Um, they're very strict about um, repayment deadlines if you don't repay um, not just you but all the social circle will suffer from that um, and they show these microfinance principles to people in some places they say if it's a poor person living in downtown Glasgow and somewhere else they'll say this is a woman living in rural Bangladesh and people are much more willing to say that those credit terms are a good thing when they're in Bangladesh rather than Glasgow which is interesting really because they're exactly the same they're exactly the same terms, it's just we just put someone in the developing world and we think that it's more acceptable to create quite almost exploitative credit conditions. Um, I think that sometimes that means that we, I don't have much more to say about that, I just think it's quite interesting that we, if these things were are exploitative in the West, they're not exploitative in the developing world. And so um, I think that some of that critique of microfinance about how uh, there's a large amount of social stigma, which can be incredibly challenging with um, for people, is true. Next observation about microfinance is the reason microfinance exists um, is because it's very hard in Bangladesh and India to have savings products um, for reasons which are entirely understandable. Um, they're 
the regulation um, for savings products is very, very strict. So, for example, if I were to set up a saving product in rural India and I went to a village and said, I'm offering X percent interest, please give all your money to me um, and I'll be back once a week and you can claim it whenever. That's something that's regulated very strictly because my incentives are just to run away with the money. Whereas credit is regulated quite liberally because um, if I've given you money, I have an incentive to come back and reclaim it. So there's far more or less fraudulent um, credit providers than there are savings providers. But Credit and savings do very similar things. You can just save your way out of the poverty trap. For example, I'm still a farmer who can't buy seeds but would have a bountiful harvest. I could just save up um, for a very, very, for a long time until I had enough money to buy those seeds. So savings are may, perhaps with more of a time lag, a good way as credit. And there is some evidence that savings products would be much more popular than microfinance um, products. Some people think that the real advantage of microfinance is that it is a savings device. You have to commit to giving back a certain amount of money every week so you can um, commit to savings. The same reasons that consumers in the West are very bad at saving for things, it's still, uh, those fundamental underlying reasons um, you know, we like things now, we don't like things in the future, um, exist in these developing world countries too. So perhaps microfinance and microcredit um, is not helping people because it's credit, but rather because it's a form of savings um, that they have to commit to. If I told you to save £20 every week um, and took it out of your bank account, you'd be far more likely to save than if I just said that you should save more. Um, when they look at microfinance, um, they find a broadly bell-shaped bell -shaped distribution. So the very successful entrepreneurs who borrow with microfinance, microcredit, do set up quite successful businesses. There is some evidence that there are businesses who are credit constrained, who would be producing far more if only they could afford um, machinery, if only they could afford better technology. And so some businesses are substantially more profitable after the introduction of microfinance. The problem there is that the median business that's set up is unprofitable. So um, when they did a randomized control trial in India, they found that the median business, so the business that was like middle of the distribution was not profitable. Um, these countries have institutional environments where it's not very profitable to set up a business. There are lots of reasons. Um, that the average person doesn't set up a particularly profitable business, whether those be taxes, whether those be low demand, whether those be intervention of government officials, whether those be the fact that these markets are often very competitive, um, whether those be low skills, um, perhaps you can give people credit, but if they can't set up a very successful business in the first place, it doesn't to me, sound like a route to additional productivity and a, diff a route to growth. Um, I would also say on that subject that individual targeting, just like aid, doesn't solve any of the institutional problems um, that exist. It doesn't make the institutional environment more um, feasible for businesses. It just means that businesses that, that currently exist and perhaps credit constrained or perhaps suffer individuals who suffer from the poverty trap can do better. Um, last thing to say about microfinance is that if anyone has done economics, they'll in week two um, under, learn what perfect competition is. Perfect competition is a model that economists have of what competition should look like, where you have a homogenous product so that everyone sells the same thing. You have lots of people selling it, you have lots of people buying it, you have no no economies of scale, no barriers to entry, anyone can join in. So like lemonade let's pretend that there were lemonade stands there were lots of people who wanted to buy lemonade there were lots of people wanting to sell lemonade the startup cost of selling a lemonade stand is about three dollars so it's not really a barrier that's something that everyone can engage in under those circumstances the price will be the price of production because if anyone can join in um there's no your cost of selling that lemonade will be um 
due to competition, lowered to the cost of production. So we say that the marginal cost, the cost of producing an additional glass of lemonade is probably equal to the marginal revenue, so the price that you get. Um, a lot of times when there are microfinance loans, um, you genuinely get perfect competition in the real world. So in countries like Bangladesh, where they give out a lot of this um, microfinance, a lot of women set up um, embroidery companies. So they do embroidery for big factories, um, big factories in Bangladesh, which produces a lot of textiles. There are lots of people doing this embroidery and they all have access to exactly the same micro credit schemes. There are a lot of people wanting to buy this embroidery. Um, this is a skill that most people have, so it's relatively easy to get in. The cost of thread is not particularly high. And that means that when they do set up a business, they don't set up a profitable business because they have to sell what they sell is basically the cost of production. So they their, co their price is as low as anyone is willing to do this for. So it's a very low price. So that means that you don't really get successful industries. Um, you get people who are producing very cheap things um, for those reasons. So it's again unclear to me that microfinance is the solution to poverty, which raises a question. If it's very hard to target people individually to make successful industries, shouldn't we go back to just picking successful industries and using government intervention to make sure that it's successful as possible? Which is why I think, again, we'll see a return to the sort of industrial strategy I referred to earlier. And maybe this will all just be a big cycle where everything is a critique of the thing before it. Um, that's... I have a couple more things to say. That's broadly, um, that's broadly the shape of most of the things I want to get in. Um, I have a couple more things to say in relation to debating. I think that I have a look on the internet. There are not lots of motions set about development economics. Um, I think that's partly because they're debated so badly. I think that's partly because it's all good debates are about trade-offs, um, and it's quite hard to work out what the trade-offs in development economics are so its aim is to for people to be happier wealthier better off live better lives it's unclear what it's unclear what you trade that off against that seems like a fundamental desire that most people would have so um i think that that means that there aren't many debates set but I also think that that means that often people trade off specific things that these development policies achieve against other things so for example there'll be a lot of talk about growth versus democracy about conditionality versus aid where you're trading off growth and what growth can get you um, with some other value in right society um, I think that for that you need to you know uh, there will be other lectures in these series and they will probably be the best place to talk about that but having some sense of why these policies might be good or bad is probably quite a good place to go about trading those off i also think we're quite bad at explaining why being rich is good um especially if you're like a subsistence farmer or an exceptionally poor person so you need money to be able to send your kids to school you need money to be able to buy enough food to eat if you're on the poverty line but also that 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 it really is true that money and, and that form of being financially sustainable is basically a form of freedom um of like a freedom from like worrying about money all the time um there's increasing good evidence that people who are poor make worse general decisions because the weight of constantly worrying about money impedes their cognitive ability there's also reasons why you just get to consume more and have a better life and the vast majority of people spend their money on things that make them happier and that's something that we think the poor should have so i think that there is sometimes a lack of impact in why this development is good um which is something i think you really um can do and that would be very good um there are no questions which is sad um i'll therefore assume that everything i said was clear um and that people don't have any questions if you want to message me over facebook um message the Scottish center i'm sure they can pass questions on to me or just find me
time around um, and I will be euros if you have any questions. Um, I hope this is helpful. I hope you feel better able to analyse in the context of um, development debates and I hope they turn up more because they're really fun um, and I think that how we make the rest of the world richer is a topic that debates you should engage in with more. Thank you.